My name is Matt Delacluse. I'm with Rako Rents. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules today to join us for our webinar today. Before we get started, please note that because of the large number of attendees, we'll be muting all, all microphones. If you have any questions, there's a chat tool built into uh, GoToWebinar. Go ahead and enter your question, and we'll try to get it answered at the end. Our presenter today is Tim Johnson with SIAPS. In this webinar, you will discover the ease of performing environmental lead screening using the SIAPS X550, available for rent from, from Rako Rents. By not using a radioactive source, the burden of needing to license and use these instruments to screen for lead paint is longer, no longer necessary. The focus of this talk will be around the use of the handheld XRF for screening a lead paint and other toxic metals in the environment. Tim Johnson is Business Development Manager for SIAPS, focusing on restricted substances and regulatory markets. Tim's early position, early position as the childhood blood lead analyst for the state of Kansas made him passionate about addressing lead contamination in all areas of the environment. For the last eight years, his focus has been on handheld XRF for rapid screening and identification of these hazards in the field. We welcome Tim as our featured speaker, and we thank him for sharing his time and experience expertise with our customers today. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Tim. Welcome, Tim. Hi, thank you, Matt. I uh, hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, as I explained to Matt uh, a little bit ago, we've been having some power issues here. So if I disappear for a few minutes, um, I promise I'll be right back. Um, just as soon as my internet reboots itself. So. Uh, again, thank you guys for joining today. Uh, let me see if I can. There we go. So again, I am with SIAPS, um, and uh, we're going to focus today, uh, of course, on soil screening and uh, a little bit of lead paint discussion. Um, again, we can you guys can rent these uh, directly from uh, Rayco Rents. So today we're going to. Just take a look at uh, an overview of what what is soil screening uh, using the XRF. Um, we're going to hit on what the EPA says about it, um, and then we're going to go into how it can actually help you. Uh, we are going to spend some time on these best practices, and uh, just like all other uh, techniques, uh, we've got some limitations uh, which we will discuss, and then of course we will have time uh, at the end for questions. Um, let me grab my clock and make sure I can see it so I know how much time uh, I'm spending yammering. First off, just a little bit of background on handheld XRF. Um, what is it? What does it do? Um, how does this thing actually work? So inside our instrument, uh, there's an X-ray tube that uh, generates photons um, that you then uh, place the end of the instrument uh, onto the sample, those photons are directed at uh, the atoms in that sample, okay? Uh, those atoms then get excited and emit a characteristic photon. Um, these photons are captured back by the detector, they're reflected back into the detector um, to produce a spectrum. Uh, because each one uses uh, a very specific energy, uh, we can know exactly which element it is, and then the peak height uh, in the spectra is proportional to the concentration of that um, of that element. Okay, so we can't see compounds; we can only see elements. Okay, um, algorithms are written to focus on certain peaks. Uh, you probably saw in that last screen that uh, there are a number of electrons uh, that could possibly be excited. Um, each of them has its own energy. So in order to avoid overlaps uh, with other elements that may be too close in energy, um, we just focus on one of the other uh, possible lines for it. And uh, in soils, we write these algorithms up and um, to, to solve that very problem. Um, oh, if the instrument is properly calibrated, um, 
using the algorithms will give you a concentration in either parts per million or percentage. Um, in some cases, uh, you might tell the instrument to do it in auto, which will then decide for you uh, whether it's going to show it in part per million or it wants to show it as a percentage. So what's the EPA say about all this? Um, XRF may be used to obtain in situ measurements at a large number of locations in a short period of time to determine if a site warrants further attention with respect to characterization. Um, and I went ahead and uh, put the citation in there. Um, I'm sure all of you can write that down very, very quickly, um, or you can probably Google it too. Uh, basically, what that says is you're going to be able to sample a large area in a site very quickly and determine what areas you actually want to go back and focus on for laboratory testings. Um, this is a screening tool, okay? We want to be clear about that. This is not confirmatory testing. This is just so uh, you can save yourself sending thousands of samples in by only sending in, you know, tens or you know, possibly hundreds, depending upon the, the, the size of the site. Okay, this is all broken down in SW864, uh, EPA method 6200. Okay, this method describes the methodology uh, and also the quality control checks uh, that you're going to be using to for portable XRF in soils and sediments. Okay, um, that last little point there. This is a very detailed document, and very few people follow it to the letter. Um, but it is a very useful tool um, for you to read, absorb what you can, and uh, we're going to try to break it down just a little bit um, to make it uh, quite a bit simpler. Okay, the biggest benefits, uh, according to the EPA and also to me. Um, Sites can rapidly be screened, right? So 6200 describes how you lay out a grid, uh, how many shots need to be taken within each piece of the grid so that you can determine where the plume is in the grid, which allows you then to uh, focus on the trouble spots uh, rather than uh, trying to find a, a tiny needle in a giant haystack, right? Um, this also, again, allows for the fewer samples to be sent to the lab for confirmatory testing, either by AA or ICP. Um, I'm not sure uh, where the numbers are right now, but uh, each element when running an ICP costs you quite a bit of money. Um, and there are minimum numbers of uh, samples that must be sent in for them to even uh, run your testing for you. Ah. Too many. All right. My mouse is having problems being a mouse. Okay. Sorry about that. So there are basically two methods for sampling. Um, and within these two methods, uh, there are several variations. We're going to discuss some of them as we go. Uh, the two types of testing are in situ and then invasive. And uh, we'll walk through, um, basically in situ is uh, you don't move it and invasive, you do move it. So with in situ testing, you're actually placing the snout of the analyzer directly on the soil. Um, or shooting through a piece of thin plastic placed in the soil, um, the main thing is you are not actually removing any of the soil to do the testing. Um, again, you can do this really pretty quickly. Um, average test time, uh, if you're doing 30 seconds per beam, it's going to take you uh, about 90 seconds, so about a minute and a half. Um, now, keeping in mind, though, uh, this is not as accurate as the invasive testing. Um, mostly because they're, uh, that last point, there are many of, many variables that we just can't control uh, in doing this. 
what are the actual variables? Well, uh, first off is area, right? So with an XRF, uh, you're only looking at about a four millimeter uh, snapshot. So if I've got a you know 10 acre field, um, looking at a four millimeter snapshot uh, is not giving me a whole lot of information. It's giving me some. Um, also moisture. Um, XRF does not really like wet samples. So keeping that moisture content low um, is very important for accuracy. Uh, the third thing there, grain size. Um, if you place the snout of the analyzer against a pebble, um, that's gonna be a different grain size than if you're putting it against um, the soil itself. Um, obviously soil can clump. Uh, so keeping those things uniform is, is actually fairly important for good accuracy. And then uh, finally, the sample container uh, or lack thereof. So if you're doing in situ, of course, you're not gonna be having a sample container. Um, if you're doing um, invasive testing and you're using a sample container that is say a Ziploc baggie, um, a Ziploc baggie will not give you as good of results as putting it into a dedicated XRF cup with proper XRF film. This is because um, the, the Ziploc baggie actually, while it's supposed to be, you know, mostly carbon, can contain some impurities. Um, the uh, XRF cups with their films are much cleaner um, and therefore will, of course, give better results. Uh, with all of these things, there is a trade-off, uh, and generally that trade-off is money. So uh, a Ziploc baggie is a lot more expensive than shooting the dirt directly, uh, but probably less expensive than putting it into an XRF cup with the special film. So we're going to spend most of the time here talking about invasive testing because, um, well, honestly, it's a lot more interesting and uh, there's a lot more stuff that can actually occur than the in situ testing where you're just placing the instrument against the ground. Okay. Um, the invasive testing, there are a ton of different variations on this method. Um, but what all of them have in common is that the samples are removed from their site and placed into some sort of container. Um, this is, of course, more time consuming. Uh, you do need some materials. Uh, you need to make sure that you are cleaning your materials between uh, use, uh, one sample to the next. Uh, but it does uh, give you that trade off of greatly improved accuracy. So let's start with the good way. Um, First, you're just taking that sample and scooping it and placing it into a bag, um, like a uh, like a Ziploc baggie. Uh, and no, it doesn't matter the trade name, um, just some sort of sandwich baggie. Uh, place it in that bag, shoot it through the bag. Um, this allows you for the larger sample size to be analyzed than the in situ testing. So you're actually taking a composite sample of a somewhat larger area than that little four millimeter that you were looking at just by placing the analyzer snout to the ground. Um, but again, we're still dealing with a lot of variables here. Um, we haven't tried to control for grain size. We haven't tried to control for moisture. Um, so there is a slightly better way. Um, you would take several samples from an area and make a composite sample, okay? Um, mix all of those together to get you a larger area snapshot, um, and then actually test that composite sample. So what this does is it allows you to draw from a larger area uh, and get a little bit better mix. Um, again, you're not really controlling for moisture. Um, and your grain size is still not really being controlled. So two variables are still out there, but 
the variable of shooting at a four millimeter sample uh, in the dirt is, is we've taken care of that one. So the way that they tell us to do it, uh, if you are following SW864, um, this is the way to actually do it, okay? Several samples are taken from an area and we mix them all together in some sort of containment system. Okay, we take and we dry that sample uh, down to uh, less than 5% moisture. Then you actually homogenize the sample uh, as well as grinding the sample. So you're grinding it in some sort of system, whether it be simple mortar and pestle or something along those lines. Um, at the same time, you are mixing the sample from a large area. Then there are a number of sieves that you can use to filter this down to a consistent grain size. Um, I don't remember the mesh uh, right off, but I believe 100 mesh comes to mind. Um, once you've sieved it down, you take some of that sample and place it into an XRX. XRF cup um, using the proper films. And uh, generally at this point, you're using a test stand um, just to make your life a little bit simpler. Then you analyze the cup uh, a minimum of four times and turn the cup, rotating it slightly each time so that you are getting a larger view um, again you've got a four millimeter window a sample cup is a couple of centimeters across so by turning it you're getting an average of a much larger area okay so best is controlling most of our variables however it is much more time consuming um, and again, there's gonna be trade-offs with everything that we do, okay? Um, the questions that you would have to ask yourself as uh, an analyst or um, you know, surveyor, uh, what, whatever, consultant, um, is what is the best use of my time and how exact do I need to be? Uh, I mentioned moisture. Um, Moisture contents of uh, say 10% would give you about a 20% error on your measurement. Uh, if you can deal with a 20% error, then maybe you don't wanna dry it too much. Um, it becomes, you obviously you're going to have to have um, equipment to do that drying, uh, or you're just gonna lay it out on the hood of the car for uh, a couple hours and hope. Um, my recommendation would be use equipment. Again, what is your time worth? And what is, is the equipment, uh, the extra equipment required going to give you enough of a payback and enough more accuracy uh, to where um, it, it justifies the use? So I promised. Limitations. Um, again, this is accepted for screening only. You will still have to send samples to a laboratory for confirmation testing. Okay. XRF limitation is that it can only do 12 of the 13 priority pollutant elements. Uh, beryllium cannot be analyzed with XRF uh, due to the fact that it's just too light. Uh, the energies that come off um, from its characteristic photons are too low in energy for the detectors to be able to pick them up. Uh, if you needed to do beryllium, uh, there is a handheld possibility uh, which would require you to take the sample, press a pellet, and shoot it with a handheld LIBS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Uh, and the learning curve on a LIBS is uh, much more substantial than the learning curve on an XRF. So the instrument itself, 
um, the SIAX X550 Enviro, uh, available for rent at Rayco Rents, uh, exceeds all the requirements for SW846. Okay. Uh, and it, we boast the lowest detection limits on the market. Uh, this is due to the uh, intensity of the um, X ray beam that we use. We don't use more power, we just use more intensity. Instrument also uses Bluetooth, Wi Fi, and USB interfaces. So it is um, state of the art. Uh, a micro camera for ensuring proper location on the sample itself. Uh, a macro camera uh, for adding location images. Uh, so if you had um, some sort of mark uh, that you wanted to show the area and you didn't want to try to write everything down, you could just take a picture of it and all of that would be stored with the data. Um, your results can then be exported in either CSV or PDF, uh, and you don't have to use a special software on your um, computer or laptop. Um, these reports come directly off of the analyzer in these formats. And finally, it can be tethered to a GPS for geolocating. We do not embed a GPS in our instrument, uh, the GPS would have to be an external device. Uh, the reason we don't do that is embedding a GPS in an instrument where you are shielding from x-rays, uh, the user tends to throw off all of your GPS anyway and makes it almost completely unusable. Um, I have used units that have embedded GPS and they never connect properly. Imagine how bad, um, if you're going through a tunnel in the mountains, you lose your GPS on your car rather quickly, um, and that's only shielded with a little mountain. We're shielding with lead. Okay, uh, any questions on any of that? Uh, Tim, I had one question so far. What is the depth of beam penetration or need to correct for various types of material? Okay, good question. Um, the beam penetration is going to be, so depending on how solid uh, packed it is, if it's very solid, you're looking at about 20 micron depth. Um, if it is more porous uh, and it can find ways through, you can probably get down to around 30 or 40 microns. But again, you're not going to be going um, inches, centimeters. Um, so this really is a surface analysis. Uh, what is the limit of detection for inst instance for lead? Uh, LOD for lead in soil. I can provide a handout that has all this. Um, I want to say it's around four parts per million. Um, I think the highest one that we have is arsenic, and that's still single digit parts per million, um, around eight. Um, and that's in certain soil types. But uh, if the joy of soils is you can't, um, certain elements still will interfere uh, due to overlaps. Um, so we would want to know the soil type to give some, some more exact answers, but a good rule of thumb is all of these will be single digit PPM, uh, limits of detection. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, limited detection for arsenic. Uh, like I say, uh, we actually, it's weird. We just had this conversation, uh, with, uh, a person in California who was wondering the same. Um, we're around seven parts per million in high iron soils. Okay. Can this XRF be used for materials verification, metal parts and petroleum industry? And did you say there is no radiological part? So the first part is yes, 
Um, and these are actually used uh, regularly for PMI and both the scrap and say oil field industries. Um, and actually I know that Rayco has at least one of the analyzers that has what's called alloy mode on it uh, that can that will identify the alloy for you by looking at a library. Um, the second part, I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat it? Uh, I think they're asking if there's a, a radiation source in this instrument, and there's not. No, there's no. There is no. So in the past, of course, they put um, either cadmium 109 or cobalt 57 sources in there. Um, we do not use a radio uh, a radioactive material in this instrument. Um, so if there's any concern about um, working with uh, radiation. All you have to do is remove the battery, and uh, there is no radiation possible as long as it is not receiving any electricity. How is it affected by organic material? So the problem with organic material, um, if you're talking about like leaves and sticks and things like that, I'm, I'm guessing that that's, um, or, or even some peat, the biggest problem with organic materials, it tends to have quite a bit of moisture content to it. Um, Cause once it's uh, dehydrated, it tends to become dirt. Um, so controlling the moisture content could be difficult, but again, you're still looking at no more than maybe a 20% error. Um, and sorry about that. I don't know if you guys can hear the horn. Um, you shouldn't have more than a 20 percent error regardless i mean we we test peats and things like that as well um just to to kind of check it and as long as the moisture is somewhat controlled uh and your expectations are um, reasonable um it should not be an issue are there calcheck standards for more than just lead uh, yes, absolutely. Um, now, we don't provide them, um, but Calcheck standards, uh, the NIST Calcheck standards um, are uh, very common, actually. Um, you can get them directly from NIST. And the reason we don't tend to send those uh, out, we don't send them with the instrument, is when you're looking at soil types specifically, I want to say NIST has like 20 different soil types to use as a calibration check and it trying to guess which soil type uh, any one individual wants to use would be just next to impossible uh, also those tend to be uh, fairly pricey um, i want to say they're around um, what did i see one kilogram was around or i'm sorry half a kilo was around eight hundred dollars Have you completed screening at depth using a geoprobe or other direct push rig and screening the soil from split spoon or other core sampler? You know, it's really funny. I actually understood all of those words. Um, <laughs> my first job when I was in high school was for geoprobe, um, working uh, with them, but I wasn't doing XRF at the time. So uh, the, the short answer is we haven't done it specifically for that, but it's very similar, right? So you're just doing a core sample and opening up the core. You could, if as long as you're not trying to look at light elements, and when I say light elements, I'm talking about um, magnesium, aluminum, sulfur, uh, potassium. As long as you're not trying to look at those, um, a lot of times those coarse leaves that you're using, um, can actually just be shot through. And uh, so we haven't done it, but it's 100% possible and actually probably would be a very effective way of doing it. Okay, I got a couple more. Uh, does the SW846 give clarity on sieve size for materials? Yes, it does. Um, actually, it's it's exact. Uh, it tells you exactly which sieves to use uh, to get the material to the grain size that you want. What in the world is that? 
<laughs> that team's opening on you. Um, yeah. How user friendly is the XRF unit? Weight, battery life, display screen, reading and bright light, and if clays or other binders in the soil affecting testing? So uh, weight is around two and three quarters pounds. Um, screen size, I believe it's a three and a half inch uh, display, similar to, uh, it's slightly smaller than, than my cell phone. Um, I'm using an iPhone Pro Max, but um, it's very similar in size to that. Uh, the display, uh, in my opinion, uh, is very good, even though I do have to wear glasses to read now. Uh, I can actually use the the unit without wearing my glasses. So, um, uh, clays. Clays would actually make it easier uh, in that clays tend to be compressible, and that then makes a hard surface. Um, XRF really likes solid surfaces. Um, I mean, the first uses for it were actually to do alloys, right? So um, a more solid surface actually should give you slightly better results. Um, if everyone, and, and don't tell the EPA that I said this, but if everyone were to press pellets rather than following um, the method that they're describing, uh, the results actually would probably be improved. Uh, at that point, there are no, no other further questions. We will go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Thank you, Tim.